This will be our 11th uh, exposition of the book of Jude. We're going to be looking at verses 14 and 15 tonight. From the, from the beginning, it's from very early on, man has had a very difficult time comprehending the, God's response to doubt and to not giving heed to contradicting voices and to being rebellious and being lukewarm. and Men just have a hard time comprehending this. And sometimes the very things God hates develop like right under the saints' noses, like being lukewarm. Or leaving, leaving your first love, being less, being less in love with Jesus than you were. I'm continually uh, astounded at how this happens. You never reach a stage where you're out of danger, so to speak. You never do. See, after, after listening, see, doubt and all these things, these are insults against God. Amen. That's what these are. These, this is, these are insulting to God. Just as though God, after what he's done, is deserving of sloppy manners and inconsideration and slowness of heart. See, this is an insult to God. But I say, I don't say that as a rebuke, it's as a warning that this can happen. Yeah. You can be diverted and be irritating God and think you're safe. Eve didn't, until when Satan spoke to Eve, and Eve listened to, listened to Satan. She no longer thought properly about God. And you see what happened when she didn't. Adam proceeded to partake of the forbidden fruit with more respect for Eve than for God. Cain, he didn't have a proper respect for God, even after God, person to person, told him what should be done. Uh -huh. it, it didn't impact him at all. He went out and straightway forgot. He even became angry when Abel's a person and sacrifice was accepted and his was not. Instead of saying, well, I wonder why that happened. I wish I, 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 I want to be in that state. Instead, he got angry that someone was further along than he was. Oh, yeah, don't, it still happens, doesn't it? A lot of people in the church get upset because someone else is further devoted than they are. They get mad if you point out how sloppy they are in their life. They get angry. You don't have no right to do that. Well, they got no right to lag behind. But you don't, but I'm, what I'm saying is, you, you do lose a sense of that. Yeah. If you're not careful, you think God's taller than you lagging behind, slowing down, dozing off. You, he, you think he's tolerant of it. He's not tolerant of it. Amen. Not at all. Nobody in heaven sleeps. If you don't know that now, you will know that. Amen. No one's inactive, slumbering out of someplace else, you know. Sin immediately gathered momentum in human history after it got started. It picked up speed. There was one murder in the beginning. Pretty soon, Lamech murdered two people. And he committed bigamy, and sin began to... See, once the door was open, sin, sin went, this is why Jude's writing this book, brethren. He's writing it because the door's been open, and he already knows what happens when the door is open for Satan's entrance. Sin began to pick up began to pick up, and pretty soon the whole world had to be destroyed because yeah, it was filled with violence and imagination of men's hearts was evil continually. Yeah, but no sooner we started over, we started over, 
with eight people, led by a righteous, righteous man who walked with God. No sooner did the race begin to multiply that we got this resurrection of pride in the plains of Shinar. Here it's propped up again. By the time of Abraham, it was so bad that God had to wipe out four cities, and maybe Zoar later got destroyed, because that they had stooped even beneath natural fences and provisions. Showing here that once the door is open, once you let Satan have access to you, you are on the way down. Make no mistake about make no mistake about this. And no number of prayers will stop it. You faith has to rise up someplace. If if we do pray, it's to wake up, it's to wake up people, that sort of thing. And sin continued to increase right up to the time of Jude, when believers unwittingly allowed charlatans and opportunists, opportunists and false teachers to come right in among them. I mean, how insensitive can you get? I can tell you they couldn't get in among Jesus when he, and when he was with his disciples, nobody could. Yeah, Judas was there, but he was held in check till, his, till the hour came and he'd been appointed to do something. He was held in check so far as defiling the other disciples. Don't lose the note of this. This was like a miracle. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, but Judas didn't leaven the lump. And the other disciples didn't get corrupted because of Judas. It, that's not like a miracle. That was because he had a work to do. That's right. They weren't aware of what he was doing at all. See, it was, that was to their, per, their protection. Now Jude, he confronts this situation, and it appears as though Jude was might have well have been the only person available in this situation. So he rises to the occasion like Shammah did. You remember, he stood in the middle of a lentil field when the Philistines attacked, and he just took them on by himself. Yeah. Yeah. Fought till his hand claved to the sword, froze to the sword. I kind of picture Jude as this, is what's happening here. He's like the only one. Sometimes God, you're, you're the only one God's going to use. If you don't wake up, the whole thing, ship's going to go down. Yes. Just like a ship would have sunk and the people's lives would have been lost if Paul wasn't on board. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I tell you, there's situations like that. If you don't rise up and assert yourself during that situation, you're not the only one that's going to be affected. There's a whole bunch of people going to lose. See? So uh, Jews are awakening the people with this with his zeal. He's not ambiguous now. <laughs> As you will see tonight, <laughs> again, he's not ambiguous by what he says. His words are so sorely needed. So sorely needed. There's so many warnings about this. You kind of marvel that it continues. The situations continue as they do. All right, we're in verses uh, 14 and 15 of Jude 1. The prophecy of Enoch. And Enoch, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, prophesied of these, these as these men he was talking about, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him hmm? against him that's a strong word isn't it now since all scripture is given by inspiration of God this is telling you that this is the message God wanted declared. Whatever God moves a man to say is what he wants heard. Amen. And that's whoever that person affects. That's what he used to say. It'll make a difference whether people like it or not. See, to, to require any, see, Jude just didn't like pin this down and say, well, I hope in future ages somebody knows about this. It wasn't like that. 
he wrote for a particular situation that was going to exist a, a lot of other places and a lot of other times. But he addressed it so God didn't have to send a special prophet every time with a special word on this. He just delivered this message once, and wherever this condition that you face, whatever this condition exists, Jude's message has got to be declared. Amen. Amen. Now he refers to Enoch, the seventh from Adam. That is the seventh generation from Adam. Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalaleel, Jared, and Enoch. Seven people. These were all generations in the Messianic lineage and they were hand-picked by God Himself. Now all of these men had a lot of other children. Now I want to just take time to mention this. Adam begat sons and daughters over a period of 800 years. Seth was born and Seth begat sons and daughters for over a period of 807 years after Enos was born. Enos begat sons and daughters for a period of 815 years after the birth of Canaan. Canaan begat sons and daughters over a period of 840 years after the birth of Mahalil. Mahalil begat sons and daughters over a period of 830 years after the birth of Jared. Jared begat sons and daughters over a period of 800 years after the birth of Enoch. All right, those periods during which among pre-flood saints, those periods during which a lot of sons and daughters are born add up to 4,892 productive, reproductive years. I can't imagine how many people were born. Now that's, that's just the sons and daughters, not to mention the grandsons and granddaughters and great-grandsons and great-granddaughters and great-great-grandsons and great-great-granddaughters because they lived up to hundreds of years. We're talking about probably millions of people. And out of those millions of people, God counts generations through seven. Hmm? You all let it register on you. Seven generations, God recognized seven generations. The seventh from Adam. Now, who with a sound mind dares to doubt election and predestination? Who is the, excuse the vulgarity, pea brain, who would question election and predestination if th that was the only thing you knew right there? How come he said seven generations? Why didn't he say thousands of generations, hundreds of generations, maybe a million generations? Why didn't he say that? He said that because these were the seven people he picked out being a messianic lineage, and when he reckoned Enoch, he didn't even count the other, he didn't, he didn't even tally him up. He the seventh from Adam, and I listed, and this, these seven generations are mentioned in First Chronicles, these seven generations are mentioned, First Chronicles 1, 1 through 3, Adam, Sheth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalil, Jared, and Enoch. The other mentioned there. Luke gives a record of these generations leading up to Jesus. Enoch was, was the son of Jared, who was the son of Melaleel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. So there's these seven. So there's three testimonies about these seven generations, one before law, one during law, one after law. Three testimonies. This is how God counts people. He doesn't even, today, he doesn't even count people that are not in Jesus. He doesn't even count them. They're not a people. As individuals, they're not a person. Not recognized by God. This is how God considers things. Now, if, when you know this, you become downright thankful that you're in the family. See, these generations that are accepted, these, this is the household of God, the family of God. So Enoch was in that part of the family. He's 
seventh from Adam. Anyway, that, I had to excuse that little diversion, but that kind of <laughs> blessed my mind. Now, Enoch said he, he prophesied. Now, here some men have chosen to think of Jude as a student who copied from various books and various readings. In fact, this is the this is the common perception that Jude quoted Enoch. Now, I'm going to establish here this wasn't this is not what he did at all. Yeah, yeah Enoch didn't say the word, but that's Jude didn't know this because he read Enoch's book. Or because somebody had said, oh, don't forget what Enoch said. We don't have, Enoch's book exists in a translated form to this day. There's still a, a copy of it. But it's not, it's not in the scriptural canon. Doesn't mean everything in it is wrong. It just means it's not what God wanted in the scripture. He prophesied. Now the following quote gives you kind of the general idea in the Christian community among Scholars, which I don't, I don't really like that word. Scholars is from man's point of view. They're, they're got thick heads by God's point of view. Here's the real official position. The book of Enoch is an ancient Jewish religious work ascribed by tradition to Enoch, the great grandfather of Noah. Although modern scholars estimate the older sections, mainly in the Book of Watchers, to date from about 300 B.C. in the latter part, latter part, Book of Parables, probably at the end of the first century. Like, who cares? Some people spend months studying this. It's a total waste of time. A total waste of time. Because it's, a, it's all, all, all the discussions about the book of Enoch is heavily saturated with human wisdom and human inquiries, and you just have, you have to leave the Bible to do it. For what it's worth, brother, given I have seen that in the past, them attributing that's where he quoted it from. But like I said, for what it's worth, even from a just a fleshly standpoint, it's impossible to include that because the earliest complete copy of it's from the 1700s, and they don't yeah. have anything but this verse dated from around when Jude wrote it. So see this. Yeah. This sounds smart to modern modern theologians, but it's not. That's what I'm just endeavoring to is endeavoring to establish here. Now the prophecy of Enoch, now Jude, this is what the Holy Spirit told Enoch to write. Amen. Mm -hmm. Enoch didn't have a bunch of books on his desk when he wrote the, wrote the book of Jude. And Paul didn't have resort to his library when he wrote the epistles. They, they were wrote by the, written by the inspiration of God. Amen. And God's the one that told him what Enoch said, whether we ever had access to the book of Enoch or not. Prophecy of Enoch is especially noteworthy because he walked with God and he was translated into heaven at a very young, comparatively young age. Everyone's living 800, 900, and he was, he was 365 years old. So he's like a teenager. Yeah. He, I wasn't even, wasn't even a teenager by our standards. But he walked with God. He's very, very close to God. See, I'm very interested in what someone close to God has to say, whether they're educated or not. I'm very interested in what they have to say. So I'm interested in what he has to, has to say. Now his prophecy, no, no doubt, applied to the flood, which actually took place uh, hundreds of years after Enoch. But that probably was the immediate context, that he was like issuing a warning because things were on a decline during his age. And he prophesied about it, but what he said also applied to the end of time. It was the same kind of situation. Because when God when God's inspires or speaks, it's not particularly with the situation in mind, but with his character in mind. I got to see this, this is a big difference. It's a big difference. Scripture's in the context of God's character. 
not fundamentally in the context of human behavior. It's a big leap to see this. Not, hardly anybody I know sees this. But this is how it is. This is why whatever God said to anybody is always applicable because it proceeded forth from his character. Yeah, right. Character, this is telling you something about God, not just something about the deal situation he dealt with. The words of Enoch, Jude said, was about these false teachers. Not directly. That, it isn't that God said there's going to be false teachers in the day of Jude, and I want you to say this word so I can refer to it. A situation happened in Jude's time that was the same kind of situation that Enoch faced in his day. He was facing a decline that eventually would end up with the world being destroyed. Now, Jude is facing the same type of thing, a situation that if it's not arrested, the people will be condemned. Now, how many people, do, honestly, how many people do you know that view teaching and preaching with that sense of urgency? That if someone's got wrong ideas, views that are punched through with holes, how many people do you know that are concerned about that eventually ending up in their condemnation? I already know you don't know many. See? Because people think, well, God will take care of it. But this is how God takes care of it. Mm -hmm. By raising up men that will point out. See, the, the decline we've, we've lived to see, particularly in the last 40 or 50 years, would not have happened if the, somebody would have risen up and yeah. prophesied and given God's mind on the thing. These, all these dead churches that are all around us left their first love and they're weak and they're insipid and they're failing. These churches wouldn't have existed if somebody would have raised up and say, woke the brother up. Either the people would have got out or they woke up one or the other. But see, this is, this is how God deals with these situations. He, I gotta be careful about saying this, but he really doesn't deal with this in the prayer chamber. He deals with this in the prophecy chamber. He didn't send prophets to pray for Israel. He sent prophets to preach to Israel. I don't know where this notion has got that we, we pray for the lost. It's, it sounds good, and I'm not about to say it's wrong, but it's just who else did? Who else did? Who else in the Bible prayed for the lost? They went out to the lost, and they preached to the lost. And they testified to the lost. Amen. Then they might have prayed. Yeah. Oh well. It... Amen. Now this this deals this deals a de did you go say something? About I yeah, I want to mention in regard to the to the firmness and strength of speaking this way. We live in a generation where if if you're aggressive. <laughs> and firm and sober, you're viewed as arrogant, oh, yes. brash, yeah. and uh, overbearing, and legal. Yeah. You're a legalist yeah. if you're firm mm -hmm. and uh, say this is the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's, this, and this that's is the this, current view in America anyway. This is how they viewed the prophets. Remember yeah, this is, yes, yeah, this is how they viewed the prophets. Yeah, Jeremiah would view that way. He that's right. Was. One of the premier ones. Now this, uh, what, I, what we just talked about, deals a devastating conduct to say that the context of Scripture determines how it's interpreted. That's just quite common. The context, the context, well, what, you got to know what the context is. But the context of physical circumstances is not what opens up the meaning of Scripture. You've got to read scripture in the context of God. That's what will illuminate both the circumstance and the situation. So the secret to understanding the scripture is not sitting at your desk and figuring out what the text is talking about. You can spend an awful lot of time doing this now. Some of us have. A lot of time doing this. And it'll be honored. There's a real student. There's a real scholar. There's a real person that needs to trust God. 
need to see a little deeper. See, whoever speaks the word's got to see deeper. They got to get off the surface. Get off the surface. Here's a context. The context of these words was the world in Enoch's day. That was the context under which they're spoken. And Jude reaches back there and God illuminates it that this context exists here too. Well, you can, you can see that. The thing that makes the text relevant is that there really are only two generations. There's the children of the kingdom and the, ter and the children of the wicked one. There's only two generations. And a generation, this wicked generation, Enoch, was prophesying against, extent, popped up again thousands of years later. Same generation. Now let me prove this point to you. Jesus said to his contemporaries that were criticizing him, Upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. On you? That starts out with, it, with Abel. On you. There's a kind of thing. But see, that, that, these were the same kind of generation. This was, a, this was of Cain's generation. Uh, of you, it'll come on you. That upon you, all the righteous blood upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel into the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom ye slew, whom ye slew? Yeah. He was slain centuries before. It's recorded in Second Chronicles 24, 21. The slaying of Zechariah in the courts of the Lord was recorded centuries ago, and Jesus told them, you killed him. Hmm. Well, this puts an entirely f different view on sin. Yes. This means, see, if, if, what, if what if people believe this? That if you, if you have the same attitude that the scribes and Pharisees had, then everything that they got credit for, you get credit for. Hmm. Oh, see, the... The ungodly legalist, he never thinks about this. The person who binds heavy burdens on people and doesn't lift a finger to help them, see, they go right back. They're participants with everyone that was like him before, all the way back to Cain. Well, there's something to think about, isn't it? Therefore, Enoch did, in fact, speak of the teachers of Jude's day. <laughs> see, he really did, because they were of that generation. Now, you'll see people, every once in a while, the news will come out, and you'll read of like uh, terrible murders and things like this. All right, rather than standing back and say, "How can people do that?" Say, "This is of the generation of Cain. This, this is Cain's generation. This is Cain's generation coming up again." You see someone that stands up strong for the Lord. You can say, "This is Jesus' generation. This is another one goes right back to the apostles and back to Abraham. And this is of that generation." See, that's how you have to look at it. That'll defuse any kind of pride. All right, now what did, uh, what did Enoch say? Jude will take the statement of Enoch, which was made doubtless with immediate application to the flood, and he's going to apply it to the circumstance he's addressing, because the same kind of people and times exist then as existed back in Enoch's day. This confirms God always acts in strict accord with his character, and whatever God does is never irrelevant. You can't dismiss something God did saying that was another time. That's right. God doesn't change. God doesn't change. In fact, he did that in another time. That doesn't mean it's not relevant for us. The only reason we don't have a flood again and again and again is because God made a covenant he wouldn't do it. It wasn't because men were better or the earth got better. Because it wasn't long. He said after the flood the same thing about mankind he did before. The imaginations of their hearts are evil continually. He, that was said after the flood, yeah, just as well as before the flood. Well, this is something that's got to be seen. It accents the necessity of discerning what's said or done by the Lord. See, so he said, Enoch said, Behold, see, not just casually listen, 
I try regularly hard not to fall asleep, but understand what he's he's saying here. Behold, that's what behold means. It's like if someone's attacking us, get your eyes up and learn where the attack's coming from and be ready yourself. When lights beam from heaven into certain times or an area or a person, attendance to it is mandatory. Let's say that we happen to live in Joplin. Let's say some fresh light of truth is, by God's grace, has shined into this area. Now, who, whoever it fell on is, isn't isn't even the point. Yeah. It's my personal obligation to find out what that is. Yeah, yes. That's why God gives light. That's why God gives understanding. So when he says, behold, he means, look, behold it. The Lord cometh. Now here again, the various versions depict this in a variety of ways. The New American Standard says the Lord came. The New Revised Standard Version said the Lord is coming. The Contemporary English Bible says the Lord comes. Darby's Bible says the Lord has come. The New Jerusalem Bible said the Lord will come. Young's literal translation says the Lord did come. <laughs> if the prophecy was for the future flood, Jude didn't say the Lord has come. But, but, how much, like, how much intelligence does it take to see that? Is this really a, a challenging thing for people to understand? That if he prophesied about something in the future, would he say has come? And if Jude is prophesied about, is he going to say it has come? No, that is proper. The Lord cometh, that is this what the Lord does. Eventually, the Lord confronts all sin. And he's appointed a day when he's going to do it in totality. This is essentially the posture of a person's spiritual life. This is how you live. The Lord comes. That's what he does. What does the Lord do? How does the Lord respond to this? He comes. He comes. How does the Lord respond if you're faithful? He comes. He, he, he comes. What about if you aspire to build a tower and make a name for yourself? He comes. He, he comes. What if you give yourself to sin this beneath the level of nature? What, what, what's God going to do? He'll come. He'll come. What about if someone's waiting on the Lord? He comes. See that? <laughs> this is how the Lord is. The Lord comes. Even when God judged Sodom and the cities of the plain, he did so appropriately. It was an epochal, it was an epochal judgment, but he didn't come with a lot of angels. His two angels did that. He just sent two angels to destroy Sodom and the cities of the plain. Just sent two. Jude says he's going to come. He's coming, coming with ten thousands of his saints. Ten, ten thousands of his saints. Other versions read, many thousands of the holy ones, or thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Now, these translations, you get the idea that there really isn't a word in language to describe this. Holy myriads, Revised Standard Version. Tens of thousands of his saints, basic Bible English. Contemporary English Bible, countless holy ones. Douay Bible, amidst, amidst his holy myriads. Countless thousands of angels, God's Word, Bible. Saintly myriads and millions of his holy ones. You see this? Oh. <laughs> it's no way to estimate. It's just this, this is beyond now. This is beyond you. It's like the Holy Spirit said, this is beyond you humans now. You folk down on earth, you can't, you can't grasp this. Because earth is just a cubby hole next to heaven. <laughs> earth is like a pebble next to heaven. Where God is and where where He fills. So on Earth, we'll you do we'll use big numbers because that's the only way you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. But it's beyond the scope of your understanding. This this mass of spiritual personalities is called the Army of Heaven in Daniel 4:35. <laughs> Yeah, 
it's called in in Revelation 19 14 the armies that were in heaven Job calls them his armies Joel refers to his armies Psalms calls it they are the Lord's hosts all his hosts Psalms 48 148 too so this uh, this vast number includes an innumerable company of angels remember he says the Lord comes and all these are all these are coming with him. If it wasn't enough to just, to just to face the Lord, you know, all this multitude is coming with him. Daniel 7:10 says, "Thousands and thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand." That's another way of saying, "How are you going to count these?" You, you, you can put your you can put your iPod up, iPad up. You can't <laughs> you can't tally this up. Revelation 5.11 says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, talking about angels, see? Yeah. So they're depicted as coming to Sinai at the giving of the law. Deuteronomy 33.2 and Psalm 68.7. Thousands of these angels came at Sinai. It was a scary proposition, the Israelites could tell you. When coming in judgment, these hosts with which men cannot contend they can't contend with them in word or deed. Not, when these, this host turns up, there's nothing men can do in the aggregate or a single, there's just nothing they can do. Yeah. They'll just roll over and crush everything. That's the way they are. Crush them like powder. We're just going to see this. And when you deal with God, God alone is enough. Understand. But because men are hard to understand he says well see that but the, with God there's this innumerable host there's this uncountable army that's very militant yeah. and if they see anything that contradicts God they just wipe it out that's yeah. it wipe it out the only way they won't do it is God says stay up yeah. don't don't do it that's the only thing that'll stop them that's the only thing that has stopped them yeah. hmm. they'd have destroyed the world long ago yeah. if God hadn't have said wait mm -hmm. wait for the appointed time now and you'll be able to come and do your work. Jews reference to this multitude is descriptive of the second coming of Christ. Yeah. Quote, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. These angels are going to come in their glory, it means they'll be seen. They won't be they're not going to be an invisible host. They're all around us now. They're all around us right now. The angel of the Lord camps round about them that fear him to deliver them from evil. So they're all around us now, but when they come in their glory, everyone's going to see them. And they're going to have to be out of the flesh to see them for a couple of reasons. One is everyone's going to see them, and the second is they die in the flesh. They, the only way they can survive the sight they got, they can't be in a body of flesh and blood. That is going to be a, it's going to be a frightening thing to someone that's lived at a distance from God. When these, when these angels who live in the presence, by way of contrast, these angels live in the presence of God. And here they come with God when the Lord comes with all these saints. What is he coming for? Well, he's not coming to see what's happening like he did at Shinar. He's not coming to investigate the depravity of the sin of Sodom like he did then. He's coming to judge everybody. The coming of these hosts is like a prelude to judgment. To execute judgment upon all. Now, brethren, from, from old times, God has warned people about this time. It's a thread all through Scripture from, from the Moses on. He's warned them, told them about it. First Chronicles 16, Psalm 96, down Psalm 98, say he comes to judge the earth. See, sounded this out hundreds of years, several millenniums. He sounded this out. I'm coming to judge the earth. I'm coming to call the earth into account. Coming to do it. Those that have lived for God, it'll be a blessed day. 
Those that haven't, it'll be a cursed day. Yeah, We've right. got to tell them about it now. We've got to tell people about this. You say, well, that will do no good. What do you mean you'll do no good? Tell them about it. Amen. God may work with it. I can tell you that. I was, how old was I? I was in my later teens. And I, I was exposed to a powerful message about the coming of Christ, and it brought me up to a, where I ought to be. It woke, it woke me up. Oh, I tell you, I was so scared. I said, boy, I got to get this. Before I shut my eyes tonight, I got to get this straightened out between me and God. There's things I can see now. There's, there's areas of my life I got I to gotta shape them up. It, that'll do that to people. It'll do it to people, but it won't if they're not told. He doesn't put this in people's hearts. He puts it in their ears. Yes. See, there's some things he puts in your heart. There's some things he puts in your ear. Yeah. This is one here. The Lord comes to judge the earth. Yes. Ben will to change if they don't have a proper motive to do so. Speak a little louder, Jonathan. I said Ben will never change unless they have a proper motive to do so. The judgment right. is a very good motive. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, there's a certain divine objective relating to false teachers and obedient, disobedient people here. Paul states it in a very, well, it's a challenging manner. He says, uh, see, this is so you won't let the unbelief of people knock you off your feet. What if some did not believe? I mean, you're making a big deal out of some did not believe. What? What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? The fact that they don't believe, is that going to make believers unbelieve too? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, here's why he's going to come to judge the earth. That thou mightest be justified in all thy sayings, that God might be justified in all his sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. That was the confession of David. Is it really of no eternal consequence when men choose to ignore God? Can you really like walk away from that situation and leave it like it is and be really nice and polite and maintain the friendship? Can you? You got to ask yourself this question. No, I, I had to ask myself the question, so I'd like to share, share the responsibility. <laughs> do you think it won't do any good? Think you shouldn't do it? Well, that's, that's not what Jude thought. Amen. That's not what Enoch thought. Jude assures us that not a syllable of wrong teaching is going to be overlooked. Uh -huh. Not one syllable. Plenty of times going to be devoted to this. Everyone that treated God's sayings, whatever God said, mm -hmm. whenever he said it, under whatever circumstances he said it, if they neglected it, God's going to make them answer why they did that before an assembled universe. And he's not going to get off of this till everybody in the assembled universe says, we see it now, you were right and they were wrong and I was wrong. Till that's said, it's not over. God's going to make sure this is done. That every error in judgment, every false word, every dumbed down view is going to be admitted. People are going to admit that's what it was. And he's not going to get off of this until that's done. And the people bow and the people acknowledge he's Lord and then he'll cast them out. Hmm? That's how particular the day of judgment is. The choice of contradicting doctrines will not be overlooked. One person chose this doctrine, one person chose that part of doctrine. And we, people explain it, they think, well, I had more friends there, they didn't, they didn't know, and he got all kind of explanations. But everybody's going to explain to God why they did that. Why did you do that? When the truth was available to you, you had full access to it. There were people, my, some of my people in earth, you could have consulted if you needed help. Why did you choose that way? They're going to have to answer. Why? Because God has to be justified in what he said. It has to, everyone's got to see it. Everyone that's ever been created has got to see it and admit it and acknowledge it. God is true. Amen. Every man that contradicted him is a liar. See, man's, and until then, it's what the day of judgment's all about. 
the choice men makes, they'll account for. Those who have substituted messages, some have substituted their message for God's message, they're going to have to explain. They'll not be able to do it. They're, they're, their mouths will be stopped, but he's going to, they're going to be called an account. Why did you bury that talent? Yes. You're going to have to answer that. Uh -huh. huh? Why did you quit? Yeah. Why, when one of your friends died, did you quit? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Young man, happened to be Brother Al Stoner's brother. When my wife died, he left the faith because he didn't think it was right. He's still outside today. Hmm? But he's going to answer. God's going, why did you do that when Given's wife died? It was his wife that died, not yours. Why did you think that was unfair? Given didn't think that. I never did think that. And I had a broken heart. Make, your own, make sure of that. When a when our son Benjamin had brain cancer, we didn't ask, neither June nor I asked God, why did this happen? Did we? Neither one of us asked God, why did this happen? We don't understand why it happened. He's young and he's innocent. You know, we, we knew God. We just asked for grace. Amen. And we got grace. I'm, I'm showing you that these, uh, these ways of thinking that are common today have been brought in by teachers on, yes, crept in unawares. You can't come up with this just by being, walking with the Lord and, and uh, knowing the scriptures and so forth. You can't come up with these conclusions. Somebody brought this way of thinking into the church. That's the ones. That's the ones Jude's talking about. All right, let's go a little further. See, any, any contradiction is not going to be allowed to lie in the dirt of neglect. It's going to be brought up. Sometimes some of the things you said and done years ago are brought up in your conscience. That's a prelude to the day of judgment. That's a prelude to the day of judgment. That's the Lord saying, look, I'm going to bring this up, so I, you better settle, that, better settle that now. To convince be justified in all of his sayings, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, I, Jude's going to expose the nature of divine judgment here. It's like a compression of truth. Phenomenal compression of truth that God can unpack it and enlarge it in your heart. He help you to see it. Convince means to prove to be wrong or convict by punishment. To convince or convict does not refer to a mental process where a person is persuaded he did what was wrong. That's not what it means in, in Scripture. Is convict like a judge pronounces sentence. It's convict happens at the point, point of sentencing. See, when the Holy Spirit convicts men of sin, He convinces them they're condemned. Yeah. Amen. That that's the kind of convict. We talk a judge's edict is called a conviction. Yeah. See, this will be done in an assembled universe of. Human personalities, all the heavenly personalities, like the four living creatures, and cherubim and seraphim and principalities and powers and archangels and angels. For this grand event, the devil himself. I'm showing how many what was is going to be at this day of judgment. The devil himself will be there, all his hosts of wickedness, his angels, his demons. At that time, it will be clarified. Be clarified to all, and all would acknowledge it, that God is indeed above all. all would, uh, I gather it would be a verbal confession. They're all going to admit this is the way it is. That he's the one and only potentate. 
Everyone will bow before God. Every tongue will confess to God. That's Romans 14, 11. As it is written, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God. See, Judgment Day is not going to be over till everybody verbally acknowledges, convinced it's the truth, God's overall, Jesus is Lord of all, I was wrong, God was right. And it's not going to end Amen. until that's done. Now, doesn't it make sense to do that now? Doesn't it make sense to go make that decision now? Because then it won't, it'll be two persons' condemnation. Then he'll say, then why? Why did you live the way you did? At that time, it will be clarified that all, and clarified to all, and all will acknowledge it, that God is indeed above. We should have listened to God. We should have responded when we heard his word. We should have been quicker to respond. We, we, but you don't want to wait till then to have to say this. All that are ungodly among them, to convince all that are ungodly among them, ungodly, unlike God, see, unlike God, they didn't think like God, didn't act like God, they're unlike God. There'll be matters, very detailed matters, but in everything, you know, the contrast between them and God will be clarified. And the ungodly deeds, notice all the use of ungodly here. And the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. New American Standard says, which, which they have done in an ungodly way. New Revised Standard Version says, they committed in such an ungodly way. They committed in, in their ungodliness. Contemporary English Bible. The deeds, in other words, their deeds were an expression of their ungodly character. That's, that's the point. They weren't like mistakes. Righteous people don't do ungodly things. You say, oh, yes, we do. We all. Wait a minute. you got to step out of the spirit zone. Because if you walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill all this to the flesh. So, yes, we'll, ad yes, we'll admit to you that we've had to go to God and be cleaned up. Sometimes on a daily basis, we'll admit. But it's because, it's because we committed it with an ungodly Prov provocation. Mm -hmm. Just like there's an obedience of faith and an obedience that's, to faith. That's right. There's an obedience of and to unbelief. That's well. right. Amen. Now he says uh, these people made speeches against God. Is that interesting? Hard speeches which they have spoken against Him. Now, we're not talking necessarily about someone that said there is no God. You know, we're not, it's not limited to that at all. The word here, hard speeches, means harsh, inconsiderate. The majority of the versions do read against him. They spoke against him. That is, they spoke against his being. They spoke against his perfections. They spoke against his providence. They spoke against his purposes. They spoke against his word and against his son. They misrepresented God in these and other similar areas. Their doctrine maligned the character of God. God tells you, I hate the wicked. These people say, God doesn't hate anybody. What is that? That's maligning God. Amen. That's speaking against God. Because God has spoken on that matter. Yeah. We don't need some uh, juvenile to tell us what that means. Yeah. God has spoken about this matter of love and hate. Yeah. Right. He said enough that you don't want him. He even upbraided a king because he said, you love them that hate God? What, what are you doing? said, because you did this, the wrath of God's on you. Yes. You sided with the people against God. 
see this, that these doctrines about God that misrepresent him, they are spoken against God. That's what Jude said. It's not just an error in judgment. Okay, I thought you were going to say something, but you... Well, I was. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> these things were spoken long. This truth was revealed long before the gospel was revealed. Oh, yes, and It was amen. established and confirmed again and again and again and amen. again, just as he sent the prophets over and over again to Israel and Judah, and they rejected them and scoffed them and mocked them and killed them. That's right. Now, if I was the devil, I'd try and keep that part of the Bible closed up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> huh? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Because it's filled with this. I mean, you can't, you can't miss it. It's almost on every page. So that's what I'd do. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd make sure people didn't get in there. Yeah. Learn about that. And also provoke men to define love on their own terms. Yeah, that's right. Make it, make, that makes it more convenient yeah, that's right. and, and easier to swallow. They distorted the great salvation. See, there's these people we're talking about here. Their sermons... Their homilies, their learned disquisitions were diatribes against God. <laughs> That's what Jude's saying. Ungodly speeches that they spoke against God. See, evil fruit really can't come from a good tree, nor can good fruit come from a bad one. It can't be done. Now, I was raised... Uh, in a churchy environment that didn't believe this. Now some of us kind of sensed that the church we were members of was going astray. So we'd bring something up about this. Invariably this is what we were told. Well our position is right. We've got, we've got the right doctrine. We've got the right doctrine. This is the doctrine that the world needs We've got the right doctrine. The trouble is we're just not living it consistently with it. That's not true. That's right. Uh -huh. You can't have the right doctrine and live wrongly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can, what kind of doctrine is it? Yeah, right. See, the doctrine is more than just a body of intellectual statements. Right. It's a living, living word. Yeah. See? But I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that response. That uh, we've got the right message. We, we haven't done too well with it. But no, no. That is an improper assessment. You've created a God of your own choosing. That's right. it, took me, it took me a while to see it. But I, once I saw it, I, I was convinced. He has spoken them against God. We know this is true because in the wake of these doctrines, sin broke out and increased. Why is sin increasing in the church? Huh? Why? Now, when I was young, if there was a, a girl in the church that became pregnant out of the church, we, whoa, we'd say, what, what? Today they give them a shower. Remember Sister Tazzy King? She was really upset one night about this. She talked to Sister June and I about it. She hears me from the glory. She won't mind. Because that happened when she was going to church. They had three girls that had children out of wedlock, and they gave them all showers. Hmm? What causes that to happen? Well, Ananias and Sapphira just, just lied about how much they gave to the church. And look what God did. It's happened because the teaching mm -hmm. has created a wrong kind of environment. Yeah. It's caused people to think in the wrong way. What they've been taught has caused them to think in the wrong way. I understand that some people can hear the truth, and, but they have to refuse it to live in a contrary way. Well, I'm talking about a message that's been received that kind of message, when it's received and sin breaks out, that message cannot be a right message. And I'm saying that the modern church obstinately refused to acknowledge these things. 
What do you do about something like this? Well, you pay attention to what Jude said. The number one, the number one thing is don't you fall in this category. Don't be one of these teachers and don't listen to one of these teachers. Amen. That, first of all, eliminate that. And the people that are under your control, your children, whoever, don't let them be exposed to it and don't let them listen to it. Even in daily vacation Bible school, that big fat waste of time. Amen. I'm sorry, that's my view of daily vacation Bible school. Amen. Glorified playtime. That's all part of the great def defection that's taken place. Something that is considered of great significance in the church is concentrated on people that don't understand. <laughs> I don't say it's wrong to teach little ones, understand. I've had some little ones, we taught them. But I am saying this is not a great work. This should be done in a home. Amen. What would you think of a well-trained and a capable surgeon who abandoned his surgical expertise and decided to put animal band-aids on all the people that came in. What you say? That's what these men have done. That's what these men have done. They, Jasper, call me in the morning. That's right. They, they take people that are in the grip of sin, in the danger of condemnation, at variance with God, and they lead them to believe it's not really that bad. If you just Come, we do only have to come once a week, and we do prefer that you do give your tithes and offerings because we've got this budget we've got to keep up. And they lead the people to believe that's sufficient, but that isn't sufficient, see, because men are going to be called into account for all their words and all their deeds. Well, that, uh, that was a little difficult for me to deliver, but I can only imagine that it was difficult for Jude to deliver. That things would get in shape where it needed a message like that? Jesus did weep over Jerusalem, you know. Once. Once. Not every day. Once. And he wept over it at the point they were forsaken. That, that right? Your house is left unto you desolate. That was a time. He wept. Up till that time, he preached. And he testified, and he showed by his works. I'm going to close there. Any of you? Yes, Brother Jason. Hey, you, you're making a point that bad, bad behavior is a result of bad doctrine. And uh, the, the other option is, is that the people aren't heeding the, heeding the doctrine. You know, God, God, oh, yes. God sent prophets to speak the truth to the, to the people. Yes. They refused to heed it. That's what I meant was a yeah. message that you see. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know there was there was that account Paul from Paul wrote to Galatians, he he mentioned this encounter he had with Peter. Yeah. He told Peter was was eating with the Gentiles until some Jews came from Jerusalem and then he withdrew. And Paul said, You're not you're not in step with the gospel. Your behavior is not Yeah. Peter wasn't thinking through the ramifications of what he was doing. No. I'm so it's, it's very important to heed and, and like oh. obey what you do know. Amen. That's the way of escape, see, from this. Yeah, this, what we're talking about, as Judah's talking about, these were false teachers that had been heeded. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's and to heed them, of course, you had to ignore that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what the Jesus and the apostles taught. Mm -hmm. But yes, it can. It is possible for people to hear the message and ignore it, mm -hmm. but the, the ignoring of it puts them in this, yes. just as though they never heard it. Well, <laughs> it's worse than if they never heard it. That's right. Yeah. Anyone else? That being in the world is a waste of time because, because if you're not ready when he comes back, 
That's Amen. right. Amen. If you're not ready, you won't be ready. That's right. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Another thought I had to. Um, seems like the Lord has filled the scriptures with this warning about yeah. judgment. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and yeah. You're right. The human nature. Human nature tends to think it's not ever going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, where is the promise of his coming? Yeah, where is it? You know, you, you think of Noah building the ark, you know. Mm -hmm. People probably, we don't know, but people probably made fun of him, yeah. you know. For over a century. Yeah. Because it's human nature, it's like you hear this word and you think, well, everything looks fine so far. That's right. It must not ever going to happen. But then we've got examples of the flood, the yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Jesus yeah. said, it's, "Yeah, all things haven't continued the same, have they?" No, but it's 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 part of human nature to say, "Well, that's not going to happen. Yeah. It's not ever going to happen. We'll, right. we'll 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 pull through somehow." Mm -hmm. You know. Well, they're saying that we've I've heard a number of times. If I get out, if I get out of the way, God will let me know. If I'm doing something wrong, God will let me know. Well, I said the wrong one. What if you don't pay attention? Yeah, right. Uh-huh. When yeah. he lets you know. See, sin hardens you. Mm -hmm. Sin Amen. hardens people, so it's more difficult to receive what God says. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, we do want to be the kind of preachers that if somebody actually listens to it, it it'll be for their benefit. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, have the bomb ready. Yes, Amen. Yeah. And when anyone believes, it, it'll, it'll scare them. Yeah. Now it will scare them. Yeah. But it'll be right there with you. I've got to take yeah. your horn oil out now. Yeah. And comfort them and say, oh, there's a way out. God's made provision yes. to escape this and to be bold in the day of judgment. There's a way out for this. Amen. Yeah. I remember years ago speaking to someone. In fact, I was only in my early 20s speaking to somebody about this. And then God was well, they said, well, well, God will let me know. Yeah. Like you said. And I said, well, he already has. It's, yeah. it's there in the Bible. No, they were expecting a, a personal visit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a sign of some sort. Yeah. And, a, and a word from God's own mouth. Yeah. And I said, you wouldn't want that. Mm. Yeah. But they didn't care. Yeah. That used to be more commonly said than it is today. Mm -hmm. You can remember times when that was, it was kind of a common uh -huh. Same. See, somebody started that same. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. No, that's Paul said that little that little line. He said, "Let he who's standing beware lest he fall." Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Thanks, he stands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jews written to people who were Christians. Oh yes. There's a. I think. I think there's a. There is a tendency. Yeah. Especially when you're exposed to a lot of truth. There, there is a tendency to, to think you're you're more you're stronger than you really are. That's right. You're right. And that you don't really have to right. be concerned and you know, I, I everything'll be everything'll come out in the wash, so to speak. And it's an it's an over it's an overconfidence that Yes can, it is. See our confidence ha is not in ourselves. That's the subtle right. that's the subtle Amen. thing. You you start feeling confident as if you've got you've got yeah. you've arrived. But see, we stand by grace, mm -hmm. and we stand by the gospel. You, you neglect the gospel, that's right. You you're can't. you're toast. Yeah, yeah. If anybody says something like that about coming out and wash, and he said, "Well, yeah, how much came out in Noah's wash anyway? How yeah. much was there that was yeah, the earth is that came through clean? Yeah. You know, it wasn't very much." Yes. Peter. The way that you were speaking about Adam and Eve made me realize that from the beginning, humankind has shown a propensity and weakness toward believing false doctrine. First, we see that with Eve, and then with Adam, considering men more highly than God. Yeah. And where there's false doctrine, mm -hmm. whoever considers men more highly than God, they're they're going to be given to that. Yep. Yes. Yep. And so the, the gospel of Christ is what fortifies us against 
the lie. Amen. We're returning to the truth and exalting yeah. the lie. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mentioned this before, but I want to mention it again that false doctrine is not discovered by study. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Studying the Bible, making yeah. comparisons just against the Bible. You've got to know the truth. Amen. 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 Yeah. And then study. Yeah. <laughs> to know the truth. It's, it's the variance with the truth. You, mm -hmm. since you've got to be exposed to the truth of the gospel, digested and ingested. Mm -hmm. And this will compel you to live by the word of God. That's and right. it's in that light. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you, don't, you don't discover false doctrine in a library. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose you could. <laughs> It won't be effective. It won't be the type of thing that will make you withdraw. Yeah. Well, I think that the scripture is very applicable here. That they that come to God must believe that He is mm -hmm. and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That's right. Yeah, that's where you have to start. Until that's right. You're, until you're convinced that God is and that whenever whenever you do whatever is in your hand to draw near, repent, submit, you know, desire, those, those that, that he will respond because it's, it's his good pleasure to save those that seek him. Amen. 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 Yes, Lord Jonathan. <clears throat> You made mention of this doctrine that, you know, if I go out of the way, God will bring me back in. You did mention earlier that these are doctrines that cause men to become condemned. And someone who reasons that way, they're going to, that, that's like a per, like permission to leave, so to speak. Because I, I'd say if you reason that way, if I go out of the way, God will bring me back in, a person will get engulfed in sin under that kind of mindset. It's just a matter of time. I think we'll close there, brother. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the prophecy of Jude. He means very much to us, his boldness, his insight, his concern. We pray that you will raise up men that have this same spirit. Let it, and we, we offer ourselves to be these type of people that have the courage to stand up and blow the trumpet of warning and not leave without telling them about the hope laid up for them in heaven. Yeah. Bless us to be experts in these fields. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.